love him so. That song we sang on Sunday morning. How good. Um, it's a calling towards song. It's a great song. I mean, it's new, but let's try it again tonight. How good, how good our God has been to us. How great, how great his faithfulness and love. There's no way to describe to you the awesome things he's done. He's good, how good our God has been. Sing it, how good, how good our God has been to us. How great, how great his faithfulness and love. There's no way to describe to you the awesome things he's done. How good. How good our God has been. We'll sing it again. How good, how good our God has been to us. How great, how great His faithfulness and love. There's no way to describe to you the awesome things He's done. How good, how good. Our God has been to us. Sure, we have climbed high mountains. We've crossed some deserts dry. And we've walked through shadowed valleys and looked death in the eye. But grace has always been there each step along the way. When we look back on the journey, all we really have to say how good, how good our God has been to us. How great, how great our faithfulness and love. There's no way to describe to you the awesome things He's done. How good, how good our God has been. The hand of God has kept us through major fire and flood. We've come through overcomers because of Calvary's blood. No weapon formed against us will prosper or prevail. We are marching forward because Jesus never fails. How good, how good our God has been to us. How great, how great His faithfulness and love. There's no way to describe to you the awesome things He's done. How good, how good our God has been to us. The hand of God has kept us through danger, fire, and flood. We've come through overcomers because of Calvary's blood. No weapon formed against us will prosper or prevail. We are marching forward because Jesus never fails. How good. How good our God has been to us. How great, how great his faithfulness and love. There's no way to describe to you the awesome things he's done. How good, how good our God has been. One more time, how good, how good. How God has been to us, how great, how great His 
faithfulness and love there's no way to describe to you the awesome things he's done how good how good how god has been to us well there's no way to describe to you the awesome things he's done how good how good our god has been to us praise the lord let's worship him together hallelujah amen an awesome move of the Lord on Sunday night. Can you say amen? Thankful to God. He is the healer, isn't he? Amen. And I believe that the Lord has touched and encouraged many people, and we're so thankful for that. Thankful to be in the house of the Lord tonight, aren't you? Has God been good to you? God's been so, God's been too good to me. Oh, don't say that, Pastor. Maybe he'll stop. No, God can't help it. The Bible says, bless the Lord who daily loadeth us with blessings. Amen. Benefits and blessings. It is such a privilege. Amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles this evening with me to Matthew 14, 9. Matthew chapter 14, verse 9. Would you walk on water? My grandmother was scared of water and she, um, she couldn't swim and uh, she um, didn't like to wear her seat belt. She said in case she ever went off a bridge. My mother said, what good would that do? You can't swim anyway. Well, she said, at least I could get out of the vehicle. <laughs> would you walk on water? Verse, uh, we're going to give you a little bit of context to this story before. Okay, And the king was sorry. This is Herod, known as Herod Antipas. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake and them that sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison. And John's head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and, was, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. Everybody say, poor Jesus. <laughs> I think that um, the Lord was doing a lot of processing here. Um, as you know from the scriptures, Jesus and John were second cousins. So their mothers were first cousins. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth, the mother of John, were first cousins. And it's so interesting how God works in families. And I mentioned this before, Peter and, John, Peter and Andrew were brothers, James and John are were brothers within the disciples, and there was possibly, potentially, uh, and I, I lean really strongly that there was another two brothers in the disciples as well. Andrew came to faith in Jesus, and then he brought Peter, and it's just interesting how uh, I believe that we have special influence with our families, and uh, God has designed it that really his, his will is for you to start with your family, really. If you're going to win anybody to the Lord, start with somebody that you know well, that, who trusts you and your family. I remember talking to a good friend of mine, uh, Peter Wright. He was best man at our wedding, a good friend of ours for many decades. And uh, I asked him, I said, what was it that brought you to the Lord? He said, well, my brother Philip got saved in St. John under Brother Arden Buster's ministry. He said, and I trusted Philip. I trusted him. So what he told me, I I figured that there's got to be something to this. And Peter came in and, uh, and uh, several others, you know, were, have been affected by their lives. And some within their family uh, came to know the Lord. And, and some um, received the Holy Ghost um, who um, maybe never, ever came into Pentecost per se. But God certainly had an influence in that, in that family. And, um, and we see, we see... Um, patterns within families. And, and when God uses certain individuals within a family a certain way, quite often that's in the DNA, that sensitivity or that, that, sensitivity or that, 
uh, ability to be used of God. Amen. I'm so glad that, amen. We're all one family together here tonight, the body of Christ, but we come from separate biological families. But you know what? God wants us actually to be closer uh, to one another than our than even biological family members. Can you say amen? He really does. God wants us to have a closeness. And we touched on that a little bit late, lately in Ephesians chapter 4, how it said that God fitly joins us together. I really do believe that he does. I believe that God compacts us. He brings us close. And it is the will of God for us to be close. And so Jesus, he obviously was affected very strongly by what had happened to his um, second cousin, John, what a tragic story. And, and it, it began with this young woman who was not a godly woman, and she danced before Herod and the court, and, and uh, obviously it was a very licentious type of a dance, and he was well pleased, and he made a very rash statement, and he said, uh, whatever you want, I'll give to you up to, the, up to the half of my kingdom. It was an expression. He wouldn't have given half his kingdom, I'm sure, but it was just kind of like one of those things. I'll give you the moon and the stars and, you know. And uh, so she went to her mother, Herodias, who had been offended by John because she was married to Herod's brother, Philip, and Herod Antipas, um, he, he took her to wife, and it wasn't the will of God. It was contrary, and Herod professed to be a believer, and he, he, he heard John the Baptist regularly, but, and, he, and, he, and he did fear him, and he feared the people. But uh, she came in. She had a, a chip on her shoulders against John, and, and she thought, thought, I'll settle him right now. I'll settle him. He'll all silence him and, uh, and put an end to his ministry right, right here, right now. She said... Um, so she told her daughter, Salome, she said, uh, ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And everybody in the court went, oh. they were shocked. But because of the oath that he had made, he sent to the prison and he had him beheaded. Now, I know the Bible tells the full story. And it can be gruesome at, in places. Uh, it really can be. But it happened. Herod was a preacher killer. Whatever happened to Herod? So I asked myself, whatever happened to, to Herod? They tell us that he actually was exiled. He lost his kingdom and was banished to Vienna. Now, the daughter of his wife, who had danced before Herod, and at her mother's advice, had requested the head of John the Baptist. I looked up some history, and I'm trusting that this is accurate, that they were on their way, they were traveling, and it was winter time, and, and there was ice. And, um, and uh, while she was, they were crossing this ice, she fell through. And, of course, she struggled, and they said she did a dance to try to save herself. You know, and it was, it was really basically reminiscent. And, and her, her head, she got decapitated from the sharpness of the ice. Now, this is according to, I know, you, you, now you gasped when you heard that, but nobody gasped when I, I told you that John the Baptist had his head cut off because you heard that story before. How many know that uh, you sow and you reap what you sow? You sow potatoes, you reap potatoes, you, you sow carrots, you reap carrots, you sow corn, you reap corn, you sow love, you, you reap love, you sow faith, you reap the results of faith. Amen. Can you say amen? That's the kingdom principle. And even though Herod and Herodias, his wife, and Salome, the daughter, weren't saved and weren't in the kingdom, they were, they were in contact with people who were. And it's interesting. I heard, I heard kind of what happened to Pilate after Jesus, after he wanted to release Jesus, but ended up sending him to his death through crucifixion. They tell us that he died. He was exiled. And he died washing his hands. I'm innocent of the blood. I'm innocent of the blood. He was tormented. Amen. Now, not wanting to leave you on a on a sad note here, I want to continue. So Jesus is processing 
what he has experienced. And of course, it's reminding him of what is going to happen to him. He's going to be executed. This is all part of the plan. It had to happen. But the scripture tells us when he headed out to the desert place to rest, and he went by ship, so it would make it really difficult for people to follow. But when the people heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities, and they went around that, that sea or lake and got to where he was. You talk about a hunger for the word of God, amen? That they went by foot. And, and around the perimeter of that body of water, and they found Jesus where he was. And the scripture says that even though Jesus was going through tremendous grief, and, you know, I believe that when you face difficult things, it, it affects us, body, soul, and spirit, amen? And while he was going through that and processing the, the pain of the situation, these people show up, and the Bible says, in this desert place apart, that Jesus had compassion. He had compassion on them. He was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And on top of that, the Bible says, when it was evening, so much for R&R, &R, eh? So much for rest and relaxation. When it was evening, his disciples said unto him, this is a desert place. The time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. And Jesus said, they need not depart, give you them to eat. Talk about asking you to do something impossible. Now, the Bible lets us know that there was actually 5,000 men beside the women and children. Do the math. If each man was married, and they probably the majority of them were, that would make 10,000. And if they all just had one child, and that's hardly surmisable, because in those days there was nothing uh, to keep them from having several children, uh, there was at least probably 15,000 people. Just for them to go off into the next community of the village and to be able to find bread for that kind of an influx of people would have cleaned out the restaurants, the inns, the houses, the the bed and breakfast, whatever they had in that day. So it would have been impossible enough under natural circumstances to meet that need. You know, isn't that wonderful when God asks us to do impossible things? I believe if we're never asked to do impossible things and if we never find ourselves in impossible situations, then we're not really truly walking in the Spirit. When you're walking in the Spirit, miracles will happen and God will do the impossible. Can you say amen? And if you don't face any things that are challenging to you right now, then um, you, you need to pray that the Lord will uh, begin to move in your life. Because the moment God begins to move in our lives, then we face, you know something, if the devil never gets upset at us, we're not probably heading into revival. Can you say amen? You, there will definitely be some kind of a storm that will hit a preacher. I heard this this prophet the other day saying, she was saying that, um, I guess she'd be a prophetess, but anyway, she was saying that um, uh, how that the, the devil will always stir up a, a bit of a stink when God's getting ready to move. And she said, I, I'm to the point now in my ministry that when I go to do something for God, if there's no catches, if there's no nothing that arises, I begin to wonder if God's with us, if we're walking in the Spirit. When you're walking in the Spirit, when you're headed for a miracle, uh, there will always be uh, some setbacks and there will always be some things that we have to face. And we've got to process them. So, all right, here's the disciples. And they're thinking, all right, we'll send them away. Good luck. <laughs> Hope you can find something open this hour of the night. But Jesus said unto them, not only is that impossible, I'm going to make it more impossible. Um, we're going to you're, going to you're going to feed them. We're going to do this together. I'm going to show you something that I have the ability to provide. I have the ability to provide. And so they did muster up what they could find, and you, you know the story very well. The five loaves and the two fishes the little boy gave. Jesus said, bring them to me. And then he commanded the multitude to sit down. And that one passage of the Scriptures tells us that he had them sit in Companies of hundreds and fifties. In other words, he, he, they did everything, they, everything in order. Everybody say in order. There was an order that was established before the miracle took place. The, things had to be in order. Can you say amen? 
I think we wonder sometimes, or we, we, we um, don't fully appreciate divine order. Amen. God spoke into a world of chaos, and God said, let there be light. And everything he did in creation brought about order. Whenever God is working, you will see order. Can you say amen? People will be in order. Things will be in order. Amen. It is so amazing how God confirms and, and sometimes doubly and triply confirms um, to us when we need that confirmation from him. So he sets them in order, 50s and 100s, that made it easier to minister. They prayed, they broke the bread, they blessed the bread, they gave the bread and the fish out, and God did something that was so astounding. He fed the entire multitude. But you know what's even more astounding in this story is the compassion that Jesus had for the crowds. He'd lost a relative, a person that was very key in his ministry, who introduced him as the Lamb of God, who baptized him. I'm sure there were great conversations that they had. There was a close relationship there. He lost him. Jesus was tired, but yet he still was moved with compassion, and that is astounding. So the Bible says they all did eat and they filled, were filled. That's astounding. They took up the fragments that remained 12 baskets full, so each of those that participated in the miracle were able to take a little lunch home. So all 12 of the disciples. And Jesus sent away the multitude, and he went up into a mountain to pray. And when the evening was come, he was alone, and he had sent his disciples into a ship. In fact, in verse 22, he constrained his disciples to get into a ship. He made them get in the ship. I have a feeling that these men, having been fishermen, some of them, at least four of them, all their lives, they were sons of fishermen. They knew the water. They knew the weather. That as they looked upon the weather, they realized there's something a little bit off with the weather right now, it probably wouldn't be a good idea to go into the boat. Hence, Jesus need to constrain or strongly urge the disciples to get into the boat. Now, it wasn't that Jesus wanted them to go into a storm and that their lives would be endangered, but there was something that they could learn in the storm that they could not learn in the time of peace. Can you say amen? There are lessons that we learn when we go through storms that prepare us so that we can be more mightily used of God. So he makes them, and I'm sure there's an argument, Lord, the weather's not looking good. We've seen this before. This is going to this is going to be a tempest on the on the ocean, on the sea and when we get out there it's it's going to be but they obeyed the lord and did his will though they didn't fully understand him they knew that he was serious get in the boat i'm going to go pray i need some alone time and so now jesus is on the mountain and he's praying and he knows exactly what's about to happen i really believe that he fully knew and he had a plan. I'm going to meet you in the middle of your storm. And you're going to get such a great revelation of me. It's nothing you would have chosen. You wouldn't, had you known all the details, you would not have been all right with it. But I'm going to send you into a storm because in that storm is going to come a great revelation. Up to this point, you might sense that I'm the Messiah. You might sense I'm the promised one. You know there's something very special. But you're going to find out that I'm not only the Messiah, but I am God, and I have control over circumstances. I have control over the weather. I have control over nature. And that everything that you are going through is part of my plan. Now, just probably a week or maybe two weeks ago, I spoke a little bit about how that God said, come down to the potter's house and there I'll make you to know uh, the word of the Lord. You're going to get a revelation if you get in, the, in that potter's house, that place where the molding takes place. And um, how that God wants to get us in a place where he can mold us and where he can shape us. And, and the tendency 
is for us to gripe about circumstances when circumstances are the very tool that God uses. Now, that storm was on its way. The weather patterns were probably already well established. And meteorologists today would have said, okay, here's all the different scientific factors that would indicate a storm is coming. The disciples were very primitive in their understanding. But they knew enough that if they went into the boat, it was going gonna, gonna to be testy. It was going to be difficult. But they obeyed the Lord and they went out. And the Bible says that the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, or the darkest hour of the night, during this storm, Jesus went on to them walking on the sea. When his disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. Now Isaiah, I believe it was, said that God walks on the water. And what Jesus was doing was demonstrating that he was God. He was demonstrating it, but they had this idea in their mind as sailors or fishermen, and it was a, a common myth of the day that it, when, if you were about ready to die at sea, the last thing you would see before you drowned was a ghost. So now the very thing that should have brought them a sense of consolation, a feeling of peace, uh, that, uh, that the essence of reassurance actually struck fear in their heart when it was all part of the plan. I know some of you think that God only serves ice cream sundaes with cherries on the top. But if we look at the, the characters in the scriptures, we find that everybody that was committed to doing the will of God got to their destination. They did the will of God, but they went through a trial or two on the way. Jesus sent them into the storm, knowing the storm was going to be there. It was part of the plan. See, they had to get to the place where they had nothing to depend upon but God alone. But their concept was, what's coming towards us is not hope. It's not something to feel good about. It's an omen that we're going down. We're going to drown. We're going to lose everything, including our lives. Let me tell you something. I've been in ministry now, if I count Bible college, for about 42, 43 years. And every single time that God was about to do something great in my life or ministry, Satan showed up. Why do you suppose that would be? Why do you suppose that early in every Bible college student, young minister, life, in their ministry, something comes against them that could almost destroy, and some are destroyed? It happened with Moses. Moses was called to be the deliverer for the children of Israel out of Egypt. God had a plan and a destiny. I see you, Moses, as a grown man holding your shepherd's rod over the sea, the water being divided, and you are leading people through that Red Sea, which supernaturally, miraculously was divided. You're leading them through there by the blood of the Lamb. But yet, when he was very, very young in his existence, he was almost destroyed by water. In fact, his mother and all of the other women that had baby boys born were commanded by Pharaoh to toss them into the river Nile to be swallowed by the crocodiles. And many, many tears were shed as women watched and their babies were snatched from their arms and tossed. You talk about a horrible thing to go through, but... Moses' mother said, well, I'll obey the king's commandment, but I'll put him in a little ark 
She daubed it with pitch within and without, and I'll send them out. So technically, she obeyed the law. But she said, I'm going to take the circumstances that God has allowed to happen, and I'm going to do my best with the circumstances, not succumb to the defeatism that everybody else is feeling. I'm going to push him out. And you know what? The very water that he was pushed out into became the very thing that saved him. Because Pharaoh's daughter just so happened to be coming by at that moment while, and she hears the little, sees the little ark and she hears the baby crying and she calls her maiden. She says, go get him and, and, and bring him to me. And when she opened it up, there was a pitiful little baby. I don't know if she was married or not. I'm assuming maybe she was, maybe she couldn't have children. And she thought, what an opportunity. I can have a baby. So she adopted the baby and brought the baby up, and it was all part of the plan of God, and Moses became the great leader. But do you see the point I'm trying to make tonight? Satan tried to destroy his ministry in its infancy. And he does that with every ministry. When Jesus was born, the shepherds rejoiced, the angels sang, but not everybody was happy. A different Herod was in the land. At that time, it was, it was um, Herod um, the Great. And when he heard that there was a possibility the Messiah was born, he said to the wise men, he said, let me know when you find him so I can come and worship him too. Now, Herod was pretending to be something that he wasn't. And you know how the story goes. God gave Joseph a dream in the night and he whisked little baby Jesus and his mother Mary and they headed to Egypt and were there for some years and then came back into Nazareth to fulfill the scripture which said he shall be a Nazarene. And what happened was a tragic thing in Bethlehem as every little baby boy that was two years and younger was slaughtered by the soldiers of Herod. Horrible, isn't it? But one thing Satan did is he eliminated the possibility of there ever being a fraud. The only baby that could fulfill that prophecy and be the Messiah was Jesus Christ, and he was whisked out. And so the thing that was meant to destroy life actually brought a validation of Jesus and who he was. And most people would never have even known his background in Bethlehem. Because the scripture tells us that when they were quest talking about, they were in discussion, the chief priests, about Jesus and said, well, he's from Nazareth. The scripture says that the Messiah is supposed to come from Bethlehem. So that discounts him. They, little did they know. There, were more, there was more things about Jesus than they knew. And so Satan will try to destroy God. He'll try to do the same thing with your ministry as well. You have a ministry. He will try to attack and he will try to destroy that ministry. That's his job to try to do that. But how many know that God can take everything that Satan throws against us and turn it around for good? And I believe that every single Christian has a ministry. You are called to minister. Now, so they're in the boat. Let's come back to the Sea of Galilee. They've cried out, it is a spirit. And Jesus said, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. Peter steps up and he said, Lord, if it's really you, bid me come unto thee in the water. Call me. And Jesus said, come. And Peter did something that was highly illogical. Peter did something that his emotions were really not cooperating. He was fearful. We know that. But he stepped out of the boat because Jesus gave him a word to come. And he walked through that storm into that storm, out on the water, and it was all right when he was within a few feet of the boat. I'm sure he could swim a bit, but when he got out so far and realized, I'm out here in the middle, there's nothing holding me up. What? There's water underneath. The Bible says when he saw the wind and the waves, the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried saying, Lord, save me, save me. I mean, this is a grown man. He cried, save me. And Jesus immediately stretched forth his hand, caught him, and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? You mean, God, you really expected me, Peter, to have faith? I mean, 
This is a storm. This is such a, a radical situation. Why would you expect me to have faith? And Jesus said, because I'm here with you and I gave you the command and you have obeyed me. And when you follow my word, all things are going to work together as they ought to. Can you say amen? And the amazing thing was that this storm didn't last nearly so long as they thought it would. I mean, storms go on for hours. But when Jesus and Peter got into the boat, the Bible says that immediately the wind ceased, verse 32. And what was a terrible trial became a worship service. And when they came, they that were in the ship came, they worshiped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Now, Jesus literally expects us to have faith in him when we're in a storm. He expects us. In fact, he told them, Peter specifically, you have got little faith. Well, if Peter had little faith, and he threw his legs over the side of the boat and started to walk on water, what kind of faith did the 11 others have? I know we tend to just look at this as a cute little Bible story, but this is a picture of our lives. It really is. And you're like Peter. God's asking you to do something, and you think, I've never done that before. I'm not ready, or I'm not sure. Is it really you, God? And God says, yes, it is. I want you to come. I want you to walk. I want you to do something you've never done before. I want you to think in a new way you've never thought. There's something I want to reveal to you. And the greatest lesson probably of this whole thing is that when you obey God, God takes care of the details. Amen? And the storm never has to last as long as we think it should. It really doesn't. The question is, have you learned the lesson? Yeah, the lesson is, Jesus, he's the son of God. He's Lord over creation. He has control of the environment. He has control of the circumstances. He can control the weather. He can enable us to do the impossible. Now, they'd just been part of a great miracle. They'd already seen him with nature, multiplying nature. And now they see him subduing the storm and subduing nature. And the scripture in one of the gospels tells us that after they got through this storm experience, that they ran into a man who was literally bound by demon spirits. So Jesus goes from calming the storm in the Sea of Galilee and rescuing his disciples in the boat to calming a storm in the heart of a man. And it's a worse storm than what the disciples went through because this man is absolutely subdued and controlled and possessed by evil spirits. And one of the reasons that God lets us go through storms is that our faith would be stretched and that we would realize that God has divine authority over every force that would be against him in the preaching of the gospel. And they have a showdown with the enemy. This man shows up and he is possessed. How many know that sometimes when God moves, strange things walk through the door? Have you experienced it? When God gets to moving, as long as things are just in limbo, he's not stirred up too much. But the moment the flames of revival begin to burn and God's moving and the people are praying and worshiping and the Spirit of God is moving, Satan rises up. And so that's exactly what happened. And on the other shore, this man came and the scripture says that his name was Legion and that he was possessed. And, and we know a Legion was anywhere between 2,000 and 6,000 we're not really sure how many, but this man, this man was absolutely full of the devil. And when he, he meets Jesus, he, the Bible says that he falls before the Lord. And uh, Jesus said, what is your name? He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. And uh, after he gets that information, he casts those spirits out, and they go into the, into the herd of swine, and they, they run off the cliff into the sea. Talk about strange things. And this man is clothed and in his right mind in the next verse or two of scriptures. And we see that he is, he's been completely set free in his mind, in his spirit. Everything about him has dramatically changed. 
We're called to participate in the supernatural. But the supernatural will always be preceded by a storm. It's the pattern throughout scriptures. Amen. And I've already said this, but if you are not, are not involved in doing the impossible, then you are not walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit involves you and I walking into the miraculous. And the miraculous only takes place in a situation where we face impossibilities. Or we face setbacks, or we face situations that cause us to scratch our head and say, God, I don't know what to do right now. My prayer for you is that you will rest well at night, keep your eyes on Jesus, and that you'll hear the voice of God. That's the bottom line. That's what the story tells us. Get your eyes on Jesus. Can you say amen? In the Old Testament, let's look for some verification in the Old Testament. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1 to 25. Now, thank God for the Jewish people. They've gone through, they've gone through a lot to give us the Bible and the church and the Savior. They really have. And if Satan's against any group of people and we need to pray, we need to pray. It's the Jews. We need to pray for uh, the uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. We need to pray for Israel. This is not new what's happening right now in Israel. This was happening back in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. In fact, this particular attack was the children of Moab, Ammon, and the Edomites. Now, let's just say who these groups were. Moab and Ammon were relatives of Israel. Moab and Ammon were Lot's biological children. I'm not going to go into the story, but you know the story. And the other people group that were involved in this situation was Edom. Now, Edom was another name for Esau. And Esau was a brother of Jacob, who was Israel, of course. So he would be, his descendants would be cousins of the Israelites. Now, there was always this tendency for things to get tumultuous in the Middle East. It's not new what we're experiencing today. It's, it's gone on for centuries and millennium now. But the scripture tells us that Moab and Ammonites and the Edomites came against Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, to battle. It's interesting to note that they came against Jehoshaphat to battle. They were, he was really com- they were really coming against the people of God. Can you say amen? But the scripture specifies Jehoshaphat. And so some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So they all got together and they prayed. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord God of our fathers, art thou thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is not power and might, so that none would be able to withstand thee. This was a man who had his eyes on God. He said, you are the creator. You're God in heaven. You rule over all the kingdoms, so you rule over the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, and you rule over Judah. He said, and you've got all power over creation, and there's no person that can withstand thee. None are able to resist you or go against you. Art not thou the God who's to drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people, thy people Israel? And you gave it to thy seed of Abraham, thy friend, forever. You notice that scripture. Abraham, thy friend, forever. And now behold, or look. He said, the children of Ammon and Moab in Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Now, when they were coming out of Egypt, the Ammonites and Moabites and the Edomites, descendants of Esau, were ridiculing and were attacking Israel. Why would they bother with them? They're, they're, they're relatives, really distant relatives. They're brother nations. 
Why? And, but the Bible says that God would not allow his people to attack them. And yet, though there was never a word spoken of criticism, nothing hurtful, nothing, um, nothing, uh, there were no threats made, there, were no, there was no animosity, they, were, they showed respect to them, yet they turned against Judah. And they amalgamated the forces of their military to come against Judah and attack. And there's only one reason for that, and that's the devil. Because he knew the plan of God, what was going to take place through the people of God. And so he went to God. He said, now you did not allow us to attack them. We've been attacked. You wouldn't allow us to invade them. You said you can go into the promised land and you can take over but don't bother with your brothers. Leave them. And he said, now look how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which you've given us to inherit. God, are you going to judge them? Are you going to deal with them? We've got no might against this great company. They've ganged up against us. But they come against us, but neither we don't know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. Our eyes are on you, God. And Judah stood before the Lord with their precious little ones, their wives and their children. And during that situation, when they did not know what to do, the Bible says that God moved upon a prophet. Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph. So he was a musician slash prophet. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in the midst of the congregation. And this was the word of the Lord to these people who refused to attack their relatives. Are you listening to me tonight? He said, Hearken, Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed. That would mean discouraged. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. How many know that sometimes we take on battles that God does not want us to take on? And if you want to fight your battles, God will let you fight your battles. But I have learned this one thing, that if I hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battles, victory, victory shall be mine. That's more than a song. That's a principle of the Word of God. Sometimes you, it just doesn't help to defend yourself. You're best just to focus on your God-given assignment and keep your eyes on God because God is the one that blesses and God is the one that increases and God is the one that performs the supernatural in our midst. Can you say amen? He said, you're not going to need to fight, but I want you to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord with you, Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not. He reminds them again, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat thought that's the best news I've heard all day. He bowed his head with his face to the ground and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. I mean, their faces were in the dust. They were so overwhelmed by the prophetic word of God. I wish that we would respond to God's prophetic word like these people did. That we would say, if God has spoken it, it's going to come to pass. If God is with us, we've got nothing to worry about. And the Bible says the Levites of the children of the Kohathites the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord. They got up out of the dust, and then they began to praise the Lord with a loud voice on high. They're praising God. Thank you, God, for your promise. Thank you, God, that you're going to take care of this situation. Thank you, God, that we're going to continue on, and we're going to walk in victory, and you're going to bless they began to praise the Lord. And another word came. This time, 
through the king. And the king rose up early in the morning, went forth in the wilderness of Tekoa. As they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, I remember memorizing this scripture in Bible college. It was part of our biblical memorization course. Hear me, O Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. Believe the word of the Lord. Can the church say amen? amen? When he consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the Lord, the beauty of his holiness, rather. And they went out before the army to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Now, this is a really an amazing thing. They set the musicians on the front lines. They still had their military there because their soldiers were all in place because they were in a, in a time when they were being attacked. But they believed the word of the Lord that they would not need to fight, but they had those, the military there just in case. <laughs> and, they, and they selected to put the singers, the worshipers, on the front line. How many know that worship should always be on the front lines? When we are facing any kind of a challenge, we need to worship God. We need to let God know that we believe the prophetic word of the Lord. Oh, my. I've had to prophesy when everything I saw was just the exact opposite of what I wanted it to be. And, and just three years ago, when our son who's before you tonight, he's a miracle. You have no idea how great a miracle. But I remember having to declare the word of the Lord over his life. Satan, you're not going to have him. He's been called of God. We dedicated him as a baby. He's been baptized in Jesus' name. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. And you cannot have him. And I believe the same thing that we declared over our son, saw him come to God, and, and God is still working on him. He's not finished with him yet. He's learning. He's growing. But there's been a tremendous transformation. And you really don't know unless you live with the person that the extent of the trans transformation. But those of you that live with somebody that God got a hold of their lives, you know what I'm talking about. We need to declare the same thing over Sussex. We need to let the devil know that we are the people of God and that we are here, we are here to stay, and we're going to do the will of God. And God is going to fight every battle for us. And what we need to do is put the worshipers on the front line. We need to worship God now like there was no tomorrow. We need to worship, we need to be worshiping God in our circumstances. The Bible tells us while they they went out before the army praising the Lord that his mercy endureth forever. And remember, the Bible says that all these things were written about them in the Old Testament as and samples, Paul says, that we might learn. They're spiritual lessons and principles. Amen. They began to sing, verse 22, and the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, when they were come against Judah, and they were smitten by the Lord. Now, the interesting thing is, ambushments, I looked it up, it means concealed warriors. Conce well, how can a warrior be concealed? Well, I mean, yes, I suppose they could have been hiding behind a tree or behind a rock, but the Bible specifically told the people of God that they would not have to fight. So who were these concealed warriors? It, weren't, it wasn't another army that they hired they were concealed because they were angels. God began to send forth angels who fought against the opposition. Can you say amen? And I do believe that when God is going to do something supernatural in a nation or in a, a life or in a church body, that the opposition of the enemy will always rise up. And as the people of God go to prayer and fasting, hear the prophetic word of God and lift their voices in praise and thanksgiving to God, 
that God begins to release angels into our atmosphere. Now, back about 30, it'd be over 30 years ago now, I began to move into a period of my ministry where I prayed many, many hours a day. And I saw angels and God, and I saw many, many people healed. And supernaturally, um, I could walk into a church and tell the preacher everything that was happening. It was incredible, the prophetic anointing that, uh, that was, ob- that was uh, released. And whenever God begins to move supernaturally, I can guarantee you angels are involved in the process. God sent those angels to fight the battles and I honestly, I do believe that, I believe that angels are involved in the harvest of the church. The scripture tells us that God would send forth the angels that the rapture would gather in the elect from the four corners of the earth. God will gather them. They're involved. They thrust in the sickle and they reap the harvest. And when God um, was going to get a bride for Isaac, I say, God, Abraham wanted a bride for him. He, uh, he sent his servant. He said, now you go into my homeland and get a bride. He said, and God will send his angel before you and he'll help you find her. And absolutely, that's what happened. Now, we don't read anything about what the angel did or said or if he appeared or anything. But Abraham was convinced because he'd already met with angels. And he knew whenever God's getting ready to do something great, angels will be on board. The scripture says we are surrounded surrounded by a company of angels, an innumerable company of angels. And so when churches head into revival, you will see God's concealed warriors. Amen. They're around this building right now. You may not see them, but I pray when I walk around this building, I pray that God will position his angels around about us to protect us and to help us to be able to do the will of God. The Bible says that they are sent to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. In fact, I believe tonight we can pray for South Africa. We can pray for those countries over there in need of revival. And we can ask God. I don't believe in commanding angels because the scriptures gives us no precedent for doing that. And I can only follow the authority of the scripture. But I do believe that we can ask God Almighty to release angels and to line everything up and bring everything into order that needs to happen in South Africa. Can you say amen? And I believe, except the Lord build the house, we labor in vain that build. Except God sends us divine intervention. Except God uh, releases the armies of, of heaven to help us. Where Heaven help us. Say amen. Yeah. God set ambushments. And what happened was the enemy got confused. And the Moabites attacked the Ammonites and they attacked the Edomites until they finally, the enemy self-destructed and the people of God never had to, never had to uh, lift a spear or a flash a sword or shoot an arrow. They just went in. The enemy self-destructed. And that's how God deals with things. And the Bible says when the battle was all done that Jehoshaphat And his people came to take away the spoil. Now that would be whatever riches, whatever food, whatever clothing, whatever jewels, whatever gold might have been there. They found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, stripped them off of themselves more than they could carry away. They couldn't even carry away all that God had. And there were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. And so that at the end of their battle, they were were enriched in every way. God never allows you to face a battle except that there's a promotion, there's an increase, there's a blessing. And you can look at your circumstances and say, this isn't fair and I don't know why I'm going through this. Or you can say, God, use this for your glory. Amen. Because God, he does. Amen. I know we think about the promised land. We think about Canaan and we have songs that would almost make you think based on the lyrics of the song that the promised land is heaven. But the promised land is in heaven because in the promised land they encountered enemies. In the promised land there was warfare going on. In the promised land they, the, the things weren't just dropped in their lap. They had to go after it and possess it. Amen. In heaven there won't be any enemies. In heaven there won't be any war. Amen. The promised land is not a picture of heaven. The promised land is a picture of the church moving into the promises of God. 
Amen. And it's never without a battle. It's never without a struggle. Oh, that God would help us to get our eyes on him tonight. Oh, that God would help us to lift our hands and hearts and worship God like never before. It's part of the process. Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Did you notice on Sunday night how many of the scriptures that I had quoted on Sunday morning and principles that we talked about brokenness many, many times, probably a half a dozen times in the, last, in the messages within the last two or three months, that concept. And it's not that I just sit down and say, I'm going to talk about brokenness. Sometimes these things just pop up in my, in my, in my, in my uh, messages that I think, oh, God, I spoke about that, but I have to say it because God has given it to me by his spirit. These words that I say, most of them are not down on paper. Most of it comes from the Holy Spirit. But I remember, I remember early on praying for um, Leander and, and Kent. I'm not going to embarrass them tonight, but I remember praying and, and knowing, you know, the struggles that they've had and, and how badly they wanted to have a child. And, and, I, and it seemed like every time I got up, I was talking about Abraham and Sarah and the impossibility. And then it was Isaac and, and, and Rebecca. And, and I thought to within myself, I hope I'm, I'm not being insensitive because I know this is an area that where they've struggled and it could, I don't want to cause pain. I want to be sensitive. But obviously God prophetically is trying to tell us something that he's a God of miracles and he can still do things even when it seems hopeless. Amen? And I guess you've been on Facebook and probably know the news. We're about to have some babies around here. (laughs) Somebody say praise the Lord. And to you it might not seem like a big miracle, but for somebody that's been praying for years, it's a miracle. Amen. And if there's anything that will make me praise the Lord, it's an answered prayer. Hallelujah. I don't ever want to take for granted these miracles. They might be mini miracles or they might be big miracles. It doesn't matter. God is good. And when God blesses, we need to give him praise. Amen. But I remember preaching, and, and, and I do believe that God directs us. And, and, and early on, a lot of things that we've gone through and we've experienced, I, I really knew these things were going to happen. And, of course, I try my best to pray it out and, and say, Lord, I don't want to see that happen. But God showed me from the very beginning, prophetically, God showed me some of the things that we were going to go through between here and revival. And I, I do believe that the storm does not have to last that long. I do believe that when Jesus steps on the boat, that the, it, it can be peaceful peace be still immediately and that it can be a whole new situation going from a situation of powerlessness into the land of the gatherings where we experience a powerful move of the spirit that brings deliverance. I do believe that the kind of deliverance that people need in their lives today, it's, it's, so, it's so deep, it's so, it's so uh, miraculous what they need from God uh, for people to be saved today. It, it really takes some awesome power of the Holy Ghost. And you're not going to just step into that without some flack from the enemy. Satan does not want us to be anything more than just a religious group. Just to hang a sign out there and advertise, he does not want us to have the goods. He does not want us to have the power of God. He does not want us to have miracles. He does not want us to have unity. He does not want us to all be engaged in ministry of some sort. Amen? He does not want us to be working together as a unit. And that's what unity is, working together as a unit. He does not want that. And if he can, if he can somehow keep that from happening, then he, he really can prevent us from being the people that we need to be. But if we can hold on to God through whatever God leads us through and say, God, you are in control. We are hearing your word and we believe the word. I knew God was going to answer. Because I was, I was saying things and I thought, Lord, obviously this is prophetic. You are telling us what you are going to do. Amen. And I believe that when, when the pastor gets up here and he's preaching his guts out and he's got a burden and, and you know, you know it's the anointing. You know when God takes over. There's, there's a transformation. There's an authority. There's a flow. It's just like, you couldn't make this up if you tried. It's coming directly from the throne of God, from the, from the, the voice of the Spirit is speaking. And we need to take it seriously and, and seize upon that like Jehoshaphat said. And said, the word of the Lord, we're not even going to have to fight. God's going to give us victory. And we're going to be enriched and we're going to be blessed. We're going to be better off for having gone through this. 
And God's going to show to our enemies, and I'm not talking people, I'm talking about spiritual forces. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And as your pastor, I refuse to wrestle with flesh and blood. I refuse to fight with people. I believe the fight is on our knees. It's through fasting and prayer. We take authority over the enemy. We bring those powers and those principalities down. We do it through prayer and worship. We do it through, work, uh, through fasting. We do it through loving one another. Amen. The, most, the, evidence, the greatest evidence of God's power in our midst is when we can love one another and be in unity. That's the greater miracle. Not that God poured out the Holy Ghost on 120 on the day of Pentecost and they all spoke in tongues and the, the rushing mighty wind and the flaming fire. That was not nearly the miracle as the fact that 120 got together in one accord. That was the greater miracle. 120 different people. Now I know we don't have 120 here tonight. I wish we did. But I believe that we will. Thank you for that ready amen. I believe that we will. It is impossible... To love people and to love God and not to grow. If the fly doesn't get in the ointment, the Bible says a fly gets in the ointment. That, that holy anointing, if a fly, and it can be anything, it can be an attitude, it can be a spirit, it can be things that are said. Amen. Like I can get up here tonight and preach and I might, I, I could go home and I could, I could just find fault with somebody here. I'm sure there's, there's, there's some fault in your life somewhere. I could, I could, I could bad mouth something, but I refuse to do it as your spiritual leader. And you can ask my wife, and you can ask, ask our son if he ever heard us criticize anybody in the church. He's nodding, but that means, no, we haven't. No. <laughs> Amen, we don't do that. Amen. And you know something? God will deal with critical people. My prayer is that God will restore. God will help people. But I pray conviction on people that are not where they need to be. If they're not walking in love and not walking in faith. And you know, basically, I've got my eyes on Jesus. And people can do what they want to do. But I know what I'm going to do is for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and, and this church, we're going to love Jesus. We're going to love people. Amen. We're going to love people. And, and we're going to grow because we're doing it God's way. Amen. This is not a political organization. This is the church of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I have the peace of God. Amen. You want to pray for me? Pray that I rest <laughs> and pray that I hear from God. Amen. That's what I'm asking you to do. Pray that I will get my rest, which I have, and pray that I will hear from God. Because every miracle that I've seen in my ministry has happened as a result of hearing from God. Amen. Brother Bond, you know, you hear from God. I know that you, you operate in, in the gifts. And I would love to see a whole lot more. Oh, my goodness. Let's stand together. I want to give you a little bit of hope. We're going to get out of here tonight. But Brother Bond would agree with me that every time that God has done a miracle, it started with he heard a voice from God. He did what God asked him to do. Amen. Sister Joni, Brother Tim, you know that's true. Amen. You know that's true, folks. You hear the word, and then you see God, God asks you to do something. It's usually something simple, and we do it. Amen. Hallelujah. And we're stunned when Satan opposes. We're stunned, but why should we be? We've got the whole book of the Bible, for Scripture from one end to the other, that show us there's a pattern here. Hallelujah. But I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. The Bible says, Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. Any conversation you have that leaves 
you with your eyes on Jesus is a conversation ordered by the Lord. Can you say amen? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, saints. He is our focus. And when our eyes are upon Jesus, things start to come together. One time, a, a dad was really frustrated. He was trying to do some reading, and his little boy kept interrupting him like little boys do. And someday, little boys grow up real fast, and, and then they don't want to spend a whole lot of time with you. And we wish that maybe we had taken more time. But this little boy, he, he was pastoring his dad. And so his dad ripped out a piece of the magazine, and, and uh, it was a picture of the world. And he ripped it up in pieces, gave him a pack of scotch tape. He said, here, go put this puzzle together. And he came back in no time. He said, look, I got it all done. And the dad said, how did you do that so fast? He said, I, I noticed when you were tearing out the page of the magazine that there was a picture of a man's face on the other, back, on the other side. And he said, I simply to flip the pieces over and I put together the picture of the man's face. He said, and then the world came together. When we get our eyes on Jesus Christ tonight, everything comes together as it ought to. Every person fitly joined together, compacted. There's a closeness that comes to the body of Christ. There's a victory. There is a flow of the anointing. God will give us divine direction, and God will lead us from victory to victory. Do you believe that tonight? Amen. Let's pray. God, bless your people. Those that are watching online, encourage them. There may be a pastor that would be watching, Lord, that's discouraged. Maybe he's gone through some things, oh Lord. Maybe he's ready to give up. I pray that you'll encourage him. Help him, oh God, to Take this word, Lord, and be encouraged. And I pray that, Lord, we'll meditate upon it. I ask you, Lord, that your people will be, will be spiritually intelligent and will take the word of God and pray it into their lives. And say, now, Lord, show us how to keep our eyes on you. Show us how to hear the voice of God. Show us, oh, Lord, how to worship and send the, the praise right out to the front lines of the army, Lord. Help us to realize, oh, God, that we don't need to fight in any battles. That You're going to fight our battles for us. And you will send confusion to the camp of the enemy, to the enemies, the spiritual enemies. Not flesh and blood, but we're talking, we're talking about the powers and principalities in this area. God will send confusion to them. And God will give us the victory. It's already been bought and paid for by Calvary. And Lord, we just need to follow you. Hallelujah. And be blessed. Thank you, Lord, that you will lead us forth with peace. And we'll break forth into singing. It told us that in Isaiah. It said we won't have to be in a hurry, Lord. Everything is going to fall into place for us. And you're going to meet every need, Lord, in your family. We thank you, God, for your promise to us. And we love you and praise you. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. Let's be in prayer for Super Sunday. Amen. And those of you that are able to come and help out, uh, if you're able to come on Saturday, maybe you can talk to my wife tonight and just let her know that you'll be there. So we have enough. God bless you.